Do you wonder why Cain's offering was far less acceptable to God than Abel's? Or put another way, why was Abel's offering far more acceptable than Cain's? We see, the, we see that the ensuing behaviour of Cain and the outcomes for him were not ideal, to say the least. So there is something really key here for us to consider. I'm not willing to accept any notion that God showed indiscriminate partiality, so the answer must be discernible here. God is not inconsistent nor unfair. The reason doesn't easily jump out of the text. It's not made immediately clear. So we'll have to look carefully in verses 3 and 4. Both Abel and Cain had good, respectable vocations. One, a keeper of sheep. The other, a tiller of the ground or a cultivator of the soil. We note that both sons brought offerings to the Lord. The Hebrew notion behind these offerings was the idea of bringing both an expression of allegiance and a gift of gratitude to the Lord in response to the goodness being experienced. We should note that from the first book in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, to the last, offering the best of what we have been given back to God is a consistent biblical theme in places like Numbers 18 and Nehemiah 13, just to name a couple. We see special mention that Abel brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. However, no such mention is made about the fruit that Cain brought. Cain may then have just brought a few vegetables, a couple of bent carrots maybe, So we have been led to believe that the difference was that Abel brought the first and best of what he had been blessed with, while Cain had not considered this to be important. So in those verses 3 to 4, you notice the, the difference of emphasis applied to Abel's offering as opposed to Cain's offering. Perhaps Cain did not appreciate enough the good gifts he had received from God and therefore was short in his response. Cain had not considered the importance of this matter enough. So as I said, we're being led to believe that the difference was that Abel brought the first and best of what he had been blessed with, and Cain had not. This seems to be borne out in Hebrews chapter 11, the famous faith chapter. By faith, we read there, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Through this, Abel received approval as righteous, God himself giving approval to his gifts. Abel died, but through his faith, he still speaks. We then read of the slippery slope that Cain went on. First, Cain became angry and obviously did not control nor deal properly with his anger. This ultimately led him to become downcast. Cain's mistaken belief about God led first to very unfortunate behaviour patterns, followed by a downturn in his feelings about himself. Cain, for whatever reason in his thinking, had offered less back to God than he should have. In verse 7, God explains to Cain some of the process that has been built into the human identity. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Everyone has equal access to God. 
God loves everyone the same. So there should be no need for anger, nor for being downcast. If someone opens themselves to God unreservedly, then acceptance by God is assured. Conversely, if someone neglects God, the door is well and truly open to sin, and potentially the domination of sin. If God is not allowed to fill the void in our lives, the void we all have for a relationship with our Creator, then there will be too much space for stuff that is less than the best. Or, as commentator David Atkinson puts it, if you set your face against God and his ways, you are placing yourself in the service of sin, which, like a wild beast lying in wait for its prey, will dominate you. This is what happened to Cain. A simple and somewhat obvious choice should be made. The door through which we will be dominated by sin and negativity should be rejected. It is, though, a choice. Unfortunately, as we read on, Cain made the wrong choice. Cain planned and callously carried out the murder of his brother Abel. When a human being fails at something, rather than just owning up to it, instead they often will look for a scapegoat, an easy target to blame. And the most righteous, easy target for Cain was Abel. We read in 1 John chapter 3, we must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. We see here the extremes to which compliance and non-compliance to God's wishes are held. Then to make matters worse, when confronted over this murder, Cain lied about it, taking no responsibility for his actions. Of course, Cain's actions could not be hidden from God. And the consequences would undoubtedly make Cain's life much harder. The ground will be much harder to farm, and Cain will lose his sense of place and peace. Such were the results of neglecting God, and thereby hurting another. Tough to handle, but brought upon himself. However, we also see that, even in such a heinous crime as Cain committed, this could not end God's interest in him. No one was permitted to exact any revenge on him. The punishment and consequences were only for God to manage. As one commentator, F.R. McCurley, put it, here was a word of grace in spite of human horror. A word of grace in spite of human horror, which is often something quite difficult for us to get our head around especially in the case of the worst of perpetrators. So it is that we see the outcomes of neglecting... So it is we see the outcomes... I have no idea what I've written there. (laughs) That happens sometimes. So it is in this passage that we see the outcomes that neglecting making God first in our lives and opening the door to sin and going on the path of a less than best life as against bringing God our best, the firstlings and the fat portions. So a question for you to consider as you sit there and we'll seek to get some responses in a moment. This is your think time. What would we consider to be the best that we need to bring to God in our situation? What would we consider to be the best that we need to bring to God in our situation? Some might have picked up that the one who gave the best 
Abel finished up dead. Of course, the person who gave the ultimate example of a sacrificial best, that is Jesus, also finished up being killed. But there is always new life attached to giving our best to God. And this is exemplified in Jesus' resurrection. Jesus said we must lose our life to gain it. We decide to die to sin and give the best of ourselves to God. Then we live in Christ. You've had enough think time. What would we consider to be the best that we need to bring to God? Or what are our first fruits and our fat portions? Responses? Max. So Max is talking about our priority to worshipping God and whether we might take that a little too lightly, a little too gently um, in terms of whether we're here on time or not. We can all probably um, have, have thoughts about that at one time or another. So a lot of our best revolves around worship. How we respond individually and corporately to what God has done for us in our worship. Other things. What, what, what might we see as our best? What can we bring as our best? Margaret. Time is something we can give to God and it's something that we can never get back again. Once we spend a minute, it's gone forever. Also, our talents and part of the joy of worshipping here is the joy of being able to reap the benefit of other people's talents in the music. Thanks, Margaret. Time and talents and at the same time never underestimating our own talents, even if they're not upfront ones. There are many other talents, skills, giftings that are less obvious. And so it is a collection of all those giftings and talents. Worship, time, talents, other things? Twice in one day, Margaret. I think the obvious one is money. Um, the beauty of giving money to God and giving it first when we sit down and do our budgeting. The beauty of that is that God gives back to us so much. So money was mentioned. We could broaden that to resources. Um, the resources that we bring back to God. I think it's in the priorities that we make in daily living, in the choices that we make, in the words that we speak, uh, the things that we share with one another. Um, Yeah, just the daily, minute by minute, moment by moment decisions to put God in his rightful place and put others before ourselves. Yeah, thanks, Ladine. So it's not just something we turn on and off. It's something that's consistent and ongoing and day by day, which is uh, it's great. Adam picked the song every day. It's you I live for. It is a 24-7 ongoing expression of our best. So where we talk about certain individual things, that they need to be a 
consistent through through life. And so it'll be the best of something one day, but each day it's the best of everything. Last chance. Okay. So we've mentioned quite a few things. I had the ones that I was taught as a young lad. Uh, Time, talent, resources. Maybe we went to the same school, Margaret. (laughs) The ones I was taught in my young discipleship. Time, talents and resources. But I would want to add our creative energy. The best of ourselves. Not what's left over. The best of ourselves in our exercise of life. Each of these are brought into the storehouse where first we worship and then go out in mission. I like this term storehouse. It derives from another book in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, any takers? Malachi. Exactly right. And so we move from the first book in the Old Testament, Genesis, to the last, Malachi. The prophet Malachi reflects on people holding out on God. We're going to read the first verses there on the screen, verses 8 to 12. Will anyone rob God? You are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locust for you, so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not be barren says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will count you happy, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Here God accuses people of robbing him because they are holding back their tithes and offerings, which should be understand in the, understood in the broadest sense. In, perhaps thinking of the word resources. And again, this does not go well for those people, as we see in verse 9. Then we get the challenge in verse 10, the first part. Bring the full tithe, which should again be understood broadly, into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. This is so God's house has such bounty for all the community to see and receive and be a part of. You might visualise that feast where we all bring the best of what we have individually and suddenly there's this great feast. That there's way more than we can consume. There's enough for a lot more people into the community and beyond. This text goes on to reflect on some reasons why people hold back. Whether literal or figurative, we read of a locust plague that potentially destroys produce and makes the vines barren. Thus people may hoard because of the fear of a possible scarcity Another excuse might be a perceived lack of resources as against others who seem to be less deserving, which is talked about in the following verses, 13 to 15. A sort of misaligned feeling of unfairness. Here we are doing the right thing and struggling, but they who are getting away with murder seem to be prospering, that sort of attitude. In saying all this, the prophet challenges the people to test the generosity of God that God will attend to any needs brought about by scarcity or other concerns. 
and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. God wants us to trust him. That the one who responds in faith will not be ultimately disappointed. In fact, quite the opposite. And the blessing that will count the most is a spiritual blessing upon our lives. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So, there are a number of existing and possible ministry areas in many churches and certainly here. Notice these are called, or I call them, ministries. And not jobs, nor tasks. For everything done humbly in God's name, for God's glory, is a ministry to the benefit of others. For instance... There is a big difference in the mindset of how certain things are approached. Being on a roster to set up a school gymnasium at 7am every Sunday morning could be seen as a big, heavy, undesirable task to be avoided as much as possible or as an opportunity to work as a team in providing a spiritually prepared place in which hundreds can freely worship and encourage each other. Two far different mindsets. And this is a real example. For a few churches back, I was at a church called Freeway Christian Life Centre, which is now called Freeway Baptist Church, and a team of people happily set up a secondary school gymnasium at 7am before music practice at 845 And of course, in meeting at seven, the first thing they did was pray. This, to them, was a ministry. And you got that sense as soon as you walked in that building that it was a prepared place for worship. Unfortunately, the next church I went to, it was difficult to find one person to come out at nine o'clock to do the same sort of work because they saw it as a task and they hadn't or didn't for a while, understand that it was a ministry. The same could be said for those who clean this worship space and the cottage in preparation for Sunday. This is a ministry. How do we turn tasks into ministries in our mindset? The answer is we consider what the ultimate purpose is. And the ultimate purpose of each collective activity in and around the church is, and definitely should be, bringing God glory. That is, bringing God glory in our faith, in our worship, and bringing others into the kingdom of God. We have vacancies in our children's program. Children who will also quickly become youth. Graham would love to apprentice someone to expand our chaplaincy ministry. There are many seats available in our prayer times. The list could go on. But these are ministries, not tasks, not jobs, not onerous appointments. So we come back to the question. Will we give to God the first fruits of our time, our talents, our resources, and our creative energy? Will we seek God's leadership in working out the right balance in our lives in terms of employment, family, and ministry? Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock the fat, their fat portions. Cain, on the other hand, became dominated by sin. In coming to worship, where are our heads at? In what mode? 
do we come expectant and ready for God to do something new? Are we looking for where the Holy Spirit may be leading, even when this might take us out of our comfort zones? Do we bring our best intentions toward encouraging others? Is coming to worship unnecessarily tired from the previous night, giving our best? Is coming to worship only out of a sense of obligation, going to cut it? Is neglecting worship ever going to help us? How has God blessed us and gifted us? How are we going to bring the first fruits of this back into the storehouse? The world that God loves needs storehouses filled with first fruits. The world that God loves needs storehouses filled with first fruits so that God's glory is clearly revealed around us. Amen.